thank you so much for joining us today for this Q&A following the film Alice Street. We are so thrilled to have this great group of people join us for this conversation. Um, I'd like to welcome all of our guests, give them a quick moment to introduce themselves and we'll jump into some, some questions and conversation. Um, do you wanna start out, Spencer? Hi everyone, uh, my name is Spencer Wilkinson and I directed Alice Street. Fabulous, welcome, Halifu. Um, I am Dr. Halifu Osumare. Uh, I'm a former choreographer and dancer with City Center Dance Theater, one of the uh, founding organizations in the Alice Street um, building. Wonderful. Lailan? I'm Lailan Sandra Hewen. I am an organizer with the Oakland Chinatown Coalition. Wonderful. And Desi? I'm Desi Mundo. I'm founder and director of the Community Rejuvenation Project and one of the lead artists on the Universal Language Mural. Fantastic. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, so maybe just to start off with, with Spencer, can you, as the origins of the story, can you tell us how and when you first learned about the mural project and at what point you knew you wanted to make a film about it? For sure. Um, well, coincidentally, I was actually living on Alice Street. Uh, when I heard about the two muralists planning a project two blocks down from where I, where I was living at the time. And I had known about a uh, community rejuvenation project and the murals that they painted uh, are all around the East Bay. Um, I think the count was, you know, in the hundreds uh, in Oakland and surrounding cities. So their art was very kind of well known in the city. Um, and I heard about their project uh, through Desi, um, that they were going to be planning, planning to, to paint on this intersection. And uh, we talked a little bit about the project. I you know, talked about my background with, with documentary film. And he asked if I could assist with um, conducting interviews in, around the community to get a sense of what stories would make up uh, the material on the walls. So I was kind of brought in really just to kind of assist with the projects and then understood what a large story um, and what an important intersection it is to the city of Oakland and these very important historical centers on, on both sides of the corner. Um, and through those interviews understood, wow, this is, this is really something we need to do something bigger here and uh, decided to really launch into to working on a film which lasted about six <laughs> six years. Which is probably not what you expected going in, I would imagine. <laughs> not at all. No, it's been at quite a ride. Point, at what point did you know that this would become an even bigger story about gentrification and activism, that your mural movie would become a movement movie? Um, and did you, given Oakland's you know, history, did you suspect that might happen or did that just happen organically? Yeah, I mean, it's the environment that we're all living in and watching the transformation occurring in Oakland, um, it's been, you know, at the time we began, you know, uh, this project, it was, you know, on, on all the headlines that Oakland was experiencing gentrification uh, and change. So even going into the mural project, there was an intention laid about a message um, that the mural was to be this kind of a, 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 a response to the changes taking place in downtown Oakland and that telling these stories is a part of resisting gentrification and strengthening the cultural institutions that reside in downtown Oakland was a big part of kind of the whole impetus for the mural and for the film from the, from the outset. But I had no idea in terms of uh, where the story would go and how intimately the mural would play a, a role uh, within uh, the changes in gentrification taking place, uh, that, that really was a surprise for all of us. Did you have to kind of reevaluate your objectives with the film as you were going? And did you have to, I mean, did you essentially change the structure and, and, and narrative? Um, you know, how did that evolve? Completely, yeah. Uh, it changed several times throughout the seven years that we were kind of in production. Um, and with the changing climate of um, gentrification, the response of community artists and uh, community leaders in Oakland uh, really shifted the narrative. It really be started at, you know, being part of, uh, being about this mural and what went into creating it. But then the story really took a complete divergent path 
um, coming back in a sense to that original story, but, but also really widening. And as I learned more about the very important cultural leaders at the Malanga Casca Lord Center for the Arts and the history there, um, I think it, we understood that there was some kind of replaying of history that was taking place. And so we needed to go deeper into that, that side of things as well. So um, there are some divergent paths within the film and hopefully, you know, it all kind of comes together at the end, but uh, we got, you know, many reviews uh, in terms of, you know, community screenings and a lot of dialogue throughout to make sure we were telling the story right. So Desi, what was your hope and, and, and expectation in bringing Spencer on and, and what you were hoping it would um, do for the project? I mean, it really just to collect interviews uh, and to kind of do that, that pre-research for all the projects so that it would have significance to the community, would reflect back the community. I actually had lived, um, you know, behind the Malunga Center uh, when I first moved to Oakland for, for a few years uh, in the studio apartment behind it. So I could hear the drums and I had gone to a few events and I knew it was a special place and I knew it was very... Like it had an importance, but I hadn't utilized the facility very much. And, um, but I also knew going into it that I, I wanted to do something that, that the community there um, would feel respected and appreciated, appreciated and engaged. Um, I thought that that was crucial to the piece. And then thinking that like, well, if I'm looking at this one building, there's this other building behind me that I didn't know as much about. And I thought, oh, dang, this is kind of a, kind of a you know complicated and uh, disparate you know group of people that we have to kind of tie together. And we are, we were thinking from the beginning that that that, that wall in that area uh, was going to be a target for some type of gentrification, just because you know when you see like a rundown space, people automatically assume that everything there just doesn't have anything. And, and even that they won't pay attention to what's inside the buildings if they're just on the outside anyway. And so we wanted to create something that kind of held space for people that, that said, no, nah, there's, there's institutions and histories and generations of community that exist right here. And to, when you move in, you need to move with respect. And that was our goal with the piece. And it actually, you know, like bef even before the developer built in front of it, we were able to influence some other developers about how they moved around us. Um, and it was, it, that, that by itself was powerful. Yeah. Halif and Leilan, can you talk a little bit about how, uh, how this project kind of came, how you became involved in the project and, and, and the role of uh, your communities in, in participating in the film and, and how you, how maybe, you know, Spencer Desi approached you, how, you know, those, as he was just describing those two buildings and the incredible communities that you both represent um, on either side of the mural of, you know, how that became part of the story and how your communities engaged with it. Well, uh, Desi uh, contacted me and told me about the mural and that he wanted to really uh, chronicle many of the, um, the African dancers in the, what was uh, in the beginning, the Alice Art Center because I started my organization called Everybody's Creative Art Center in 1977. And we were lucky enough to be in an era where we had a black mayor of Oakland who was very much open to trying to bring up the arts of uh, people of color and giving organizations that had not been, been usually funded by the city some semblance of, a, of an arts funding in order for us to thrive in our communities. And we took that impetus and was able to um, create the Alice Art Center back in 1986, which happened to be my organization's fourth building that we, um, that we had occupied in, um, since 1977. So to see uh, how much this gentrification has impacted arts organizations within 10 years we had that was our fourth building and we were hoping that it was going to be our final and last building that we would have to relocate to so it was um uh everybody's creative arts center which was morphing into city center dance theater the oakland ballet and it was also the um 
Oakland Ensemble Theater, the primary black theater company in Oakland at that time. We're talking about the mid 60s when the Alice Art Center opened up. So when I was asked to um, be a part of the interviews for the film, I was able to bring all of that context, that history to um, the uh, Alice Arts building that eventually became the Malanga Cascade Lord Center. Uh, Malanga Cascade Lord himself was a dear friend of mine um, uh, who tragically uh, died of a car accident in 2003. And the whole activism of the Oakland African dance community it, uh, going to City Hall and really showing a sense of ownership of that area, the building, and what we had created in terms of African and Black dance arts um, was a part of it, the building itself becoming the Malanga Cascade Lord Center. And the film actually allows that kind of chronicling of that development and that potency of the Black dance community in Oakland to really emerge um, coming out of uh, the mural. And I must say that um, Desi and his crew did an excellent job of chronicling all the artists who came through that center. Yeah, no easy task either. <laughs> I would imagine that's a lot to cover. It's a good thing you had such a big wall. Um, <laughs> Layla? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of history. Um, so let's see, my uh, family goes back uh, through Oakland Chinatown history um, to 1906, you know, when Oakland Chinatown really boomed after the San Francisco earthquake. Um, and, you know, so my family is very rooted there. And it just happened to be that my mom was uh, being featured on the mural um, as one of the uh, first Asian American and women mayors of Oakland. Um, so I kind of got like got wind of the project through that um and I think uh, Desi was also you know asking um if there were resources because they were like I think they were you know realizing that there was a film emerging from this project and that they were looking for some resources to actually pay for this film so um you know I was actually at the same time working for a national coalition called the uh, National Coalition for Asia Pacific American Community Development. And I was actually tasked as the anti-displacement equitable development uh, community organizer uh, within that coalition. And so I had actually been traveling to um, 10 different regions across the country looking at uh, displacement in our cultural districts. So um, everything kind of aligned in this moment when I got this email, um, you know, I often track developments happening and uh, saw that there was a development uh, planned for the site where the mural was kind of immediately after the mural got finished. <laughs> and I contacted Desi and I was like, wait, is this the same site as the mural? Um, and so I ended up, I think pretty soon after going to the planning commission meeting, um, you know, that's featured in the film and really seeing the Malanga community being disrespected and the Oakland community being disrespected by that process. And it just made me so angry. Um, and I knew that the Oakland Chinatown Coalition had participated in a six year process to develop the Lake Merritt area specific plan for that area to identify um, and build up affordable housing, to make it a community and family friendly neighborhood, and that the developments that were being proposed were not in line with what the goals of the community were, um, you know, after going through this six year process that the planning department didn't really seem to care if these projects aligned or contributed to these community goals that had been developed and promised to the community over many years. Um, so there was, a, I think, a 28% affordable housing goal, and they weren't asking for any of the projects, um, the new projects, to, to contribute to that goal. And so we were like, okay, well, how is this going to happen? You know, is it just going to be another plan that has great goals, but no actual implementation? Um, and, and for us, of course, that, you know, meant a lot in terms of, you know, having affordable housing units where our families could live at a time when we were being crunched and the, the rents were going up. Um, so, yeah, everything kind of uh, came to a head um, at that moment, you know, for Oakland when, when our city was changing quite a bit. 
So I'm wondering, I'm presuming that, that the community, in the whole Alistair community has seen the film. Have you shared it with them? You said you had some community screenings, is that right, Spencer? We've had several over the year, uh, last couple of years, and obviously the story continued to evolve. Um, and, you know, many of them have seen the film and many will get a chance to see the film soon, um, you know, at the Mill Valley Film Festival. So we're excited to... What has the general response been so far um, from each of your communities and, you know, how are you feeling about how it's, how it's come together? Um, asking me or yeah. the... Yeah. All of you. Yeah. Oh yeah, well, um, it's been overwhelming, uh, the positive response that we've gotten uh, for the film. Uh, it's kind of unexpected to have such positive and um, welcoming uh, festival attention for the film. Um, so the next few months are gonna be very busy for Alice Street and that's very exciting. Um, but uh, as you asked, you know, the most important kind of audience for this film to really uh, approve of it and um, feel good about it are the communities that the film really addresses. And that's been the intention from the beginning. So we did have community screenings and got feedback. Um, I know Leilan's seen the film. I think Halifu has seen. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, the film for sure. For sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so they can speak for themselves about that. But yeah. Well, uh, I think that it, I am just so um, fulfilled that we have the film because now the film is going to be representative of what the mural would have been. Because if we didn't have the film, you know, we, we would not be able to see the, the beautiful artwork and the memory of all of those people, many of whom are ancestors now, um, uh, in, 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 uh, that was chronicled in that, in that mural. So the film is very important. The, the uh, particular showing and panel discussion that I participated in really uh, showed how much the community, especially the uh, African dance community that I'm a part of in Oakland, um, was very pleased with it, very um, fulfilled by the fact that their story is being told and it's, it's being um, kept for uh, posterity and that we will be able to um, have that story not die. The film allows that to happen. So uh, it's been very much appreciated by my community for sure. Yeah, I think we still need to set up kind of a Chinatown specific uh, screening, but we did have one Afro-Asian solidarity event uh, last year, and that was really beautiful, um, really to lift up kind of the history, you know, of Afro-Asian solidarity um, in Oakland and, you know, across the country, um, and then to be able to, you know, see this as an example of a time when communities come together to fight um, for common, you know, goals. Um, so I think, you know, definitely documenting uh, the work that has happened over the past many years to, you know, help defend our communities. Um, people are really excited about that. And, you know, it's happening in, in our neighborhoods across the country. And so being able to share that story with others, I think is going to be really helpful. And, and can you talk actually a little bit about that coalition building process? Um, like the, the, it was just, that was one of the most, you know, beautiful things, the way the diverse communities, you know, the neighborhood come together. It, it reminded me, I don't know if you guys have seen, there was a documentary out earlier this year called the first rainbow coalition that was on PBS about, um, the black Panthers forming a coalition with the Latino young Lords and the Southern white young Patriots in 1969 in Chicago. And it was just so inspiring to see the same intercultural Alliance building in modern day Oakland. So I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that process evolved for you guys. Cause I think that was such a compelling part of this story. Well, now I know that I can speak to the, the general coalition among what, what we used to call back in the day, thir the third world, liberation uh, coalition um, that came out of San Francisco uh, State University where I was an undergraduate. When the, the fight for black studies happened, it, uh, it morphed very quickly into the third world liberation front where the, the uh, Chicano and Latino communities, the Asian communities, uh, Native American communities came together to form a, uh, the solidarity 
to, uh, to fight for ethnic studies in the um, university higher education system. So um, that vibe has always existed in the Bay Area and Oakland being so um, diverse and that particular corner, 14th and Alice Street being an intersection between the, um, the African and African American and Chinese and general Asian communities um, really was a natural uh, for building that kind of a coalition. But my main point is, is that the, the whole impetus for that kind of coalition has always existed in the Bay Area, um, but on both sides, San Francisco and the East Bay, and, and Oakland being such a diverse city, that, that potential, especially coming out of the, the activism of the Black Panthers, who were very well aware of the larger liberation movements that were going on um, in the late 60s, that has always been a part of the, um, what, how can I call it? I, I would say the, uh, the image and the um, profile of what Oakland is all about. Does it, did you want to go? Can I answer that? Just as far as perspective from your communities of how, how you felt that coalition building came about in, in, this, in this case? Le Leyline just grabbed us. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go. <laughs> I mean, really like, you know, after that planning commission meeting, it was like, we, we, like, I think we all wanted to do something, but she was the only one who really had a clue about like where to go with it because she had been studying it from um, the policy level. And so, um, well, there's a lot of people that were ready to, to, to move. Um, and we needed to figure out like how to file the appeal and what it would take. We had to raise all this money. Just, you have to spend like $750, was it? Just to file your appeal to, to, to against their development. Like $1,900, so I think. <laughs> it was crazy. It was a lot of money. We had to do a GoFundMe campaign, like right away. And like, it has to be here within two weeks. Let's go. Like, and you have to file it like like within 14 days and um so fortunately like she understood some of just the the, the practical nuts and bolts pieces and then everyone else was able to coalesce around that um and 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 we all had we had a lot of intelligent people at the table and so that 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 brought the developer into the room and, and got a conversation going that that led to those benefits you know so i think that that's really important um, and now we just like literally like, what was it, Sunday, Saturday or Sunday, we finished the, the, the new mural uh, from, the, from uh, the developer um, that the developer paid for. And it includes a lot of photos from the film and um, just and uh, from that movement itself. So like the, the new mural incorporates the story of Alice Street inside of it. And unfortunately that's not caught in the film, but you can see it at, uh, at the Green Lining Institute in downtown Oakland. <laughs> yeah, and I wanna thank Ahali Fu for kind of touching back onto the history, cause I think that's kind of where I was forged from. My parents were involved in the Third World Liberation Front at UC Berkeley, establishing Asian American studies and working together with folks across uh, races and cultures. Yeah, and so I kind of was bred and grew up like that and thinking like that. So I think that's right. That is part of the Oakland identity. Um, you know, of course, that doesn't mean that we haven't had tensions, but, you know, across our communities, but that, you know, a lot of us have, have um, you know, been raised in solidarity and um, understanding that our communities face a lot of common challenges, different challenges and common challenges. Um, but I do think, you know, the film actually highlights it when, you know, we talk about how, you know, the the gentrification and the displacement and the kind of gutting of our culture in Oakland generated solidarity. You know, you kind of would walk down the street and kind of get a sense of like, who's a gentrifier, who's new and who's been here for a while. I actually felt this, this sense of, you know, just unity and, and connection with people who um, were all kind of feeling and thinking the same thing, but didn't have a space to express that and forge that. Um, so you kind of know when a movement is ripe, when, you know, everybody just just kind of 
jumps and pounces at the same time and it is ready to move very quickly. So yeah, like Desi said, we had 10 days to appeal the project um, and we raised, yeah, I think it was yeah about $2,000 in three days um, because people were so motivated to yeah protect you know this mural but to protect our history and to protect our place in this city um, and then I think over time, you know, we, we went to planning commission meetings, we went to so many city council meetings and, you know, we would just put the call out and just people would just show up, you know, they would just say, I don't have a voice right now and I feel like we're disappearing and I feel like we're threatened right now and, you know, this is what we need. So we kind of were able to create kind of this lightning rod and focal point for folks and, and what they were feeling in the city, um, being left out of planning processes for decades and decades. Um, you know, the city just giving away properties and land to developers, you know, not asking, you know, much from them. Um, people were sick and tired of that over many decades. Um, and I think one important thing that actually wasn't able to get documented in the film that I was thinking about as I was watching it um, is that we actually were able to build some really powerful coalition with the labor unions who actually build these buildings. Um, and so, you know, it was Chinatown and it was the Malanga arts community. And then we also, you know, created alliances with, um, yeah, some of the electricians and the sprinkler fitters and the folks who, you know, wanted labor contracts on these projects um, because, you know, they also were being displaced from their communities and they needed work and they, you know, these developers were bringing in, you know, cheaper labor from, you know, so Southern California to build in Oakland and they weren't paying local workers with the local wages that they need to sustain themselves in the Bay Area. And so that was actually a really beautiful moment where we all went to city council together and were able to use, you know, by that point, the labor unions were paying for the appeals because <laughs> um, they had an interest in it, but we were able to align the interests um, of many different communities and say, we're going to take a stand for our city right now. Amazing. And, and I think that that, that uh, particular testimony shows how much change happens from the, gr uh, from the ground up that, True change does not come from the, the policy makers or the politicians, uh, the businessmen and women and the developers, but it comes from the community saying enough is enough. And um, that's a perfect story, Lila, and I'm, I'm so glad you, you, you told that. You know, to get the labor unions involved as well, you know, that's, that's some, some significant change and hopefully you know, I think that, that, that the whole story around this should be documented as a model for other places. Oh, absolutely. That, and that's, I'm just so impressed by the community benefit agreements that you came up with were, were just, to me, that's what's so brilliant is that it's not, it's, I think it's always seen as this black and white story between, you know, gentrification over improving your neighborhood and oh, people getting displaced and, but you still need the housing, where do we find the common ground and being able to see the value in, all of it that they can have a both and essentially. Um, can you talk a little bit about how the um, the benefit the community benefit agreements that you fought for are working out at this point now that there's a little bit of time that's passed? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing, yeah, all the projects that we, we worked on a few years ago, they're all being built right now and being finalized right now. Um, so, you know, the affordable housing that um, was, you know, one in um, one of the largest projects and tallest projects here in downtown Oakland, you know, is, is the few affordable units that are actually being built at this time um, because we can't have inclusionary zoning because um, of Costa Hawkins and, you know, needing to over return Costa Hawkins. Um, but because Oakland never moved, actually in the 1990s when, you know, they had a chance to implement inclusionary housing, just like San Francisco and New York and other places. Um, the developers bought off the city council members at that time and, and, and blocked our ability to actually have real inclusionary housing. So in a sense, they really forced us, you know, as grassroots, you know, <laughs> broke organizers <laughs> to be the ones to enforce what our city actually needed, right? Um, and, and, and the only tool that we had was, was the appeal process, right? 
right? Um, so yeah, so those units being built right now are some of the very few affordable units being built now that, you know, Jerry Brown gutted the, the state redevelopment uh, agency and we have very few funds for affordable housing right now. Um, we have participated in the retail advisory boards, the public art advisory boards um, to make sure that communities are at the table in the development process. Um, and we just released uh, the affordable housing, sorry, the anti-displacement uh, funds um, last year. So we had a committee of folks, uh, representative of different uh, constituencies in the neighborhoods, um, get together and decide on how they wanted to split up. I think the first round of $150,000 uh, to go towards anti-displacement measures in the neighborhood. And then we have, I think, two more rounds left of that to go um, to be able to, yeah, protect and support businesses who are getting displaced right now, especially right now, um, but also to support, you know, community-based organizations to do that work of, you know, tenant education, um, doing placekeeping work and, you know, supporting some of the arts and narrative work uh, happening in the neighborhood as well. Um, so that was really exciting and an exciting process in itself for the community to decide themselves and how to use that fund and then you know, I think it's really a model for other uh, neighborhoods and then potentially for a citywide anti-displacement fund that now um, is being uh, included as part of the request, I think, for the new A stadium that will be, uh, you know, that is being proposed for downtown Oakland um, and the Jack London waterfront. Um, and then also after that, you know, we also stopped the A's from coming into East Lake and Chinatown. Um, and so that movement kind of kept growing and building you know after you know the story kept going after the film ends okay, thank you so it, it seemed it felt a little bittersweet seeing the mural sacrificed essentially for the greater good is it felt like as, as you know to get all that community agreement with the developers and um uh i'm just wondering i mean obviously you also had the option to the opportunity to make this new mural but you know as as you know there was a lot documented in there that thankfully is now in the film but i'm just wondering desi how that felt for you knowing that you had created this mural that ended up in, in you know catalyzing this movement that allowed for all these opportunities but that the, the, the mural still kind of got covered in the end i uh, i mean i lost a lot more than that so like <laughs> You know, the, the, the woman at the end of the credits is, was my wife. And um, so, like, there's levels to, to what you're losing. Um, but it, it's tough. It was tough, like, seeing the construction in front of it, kind of seeing how they even, like, you, I caught them putting marks on the mural and stuff like that uh, to mark what they're, they're, they're digging and stuff and, and just seeing it gets getting covered and dusty and then blocked from view. It's... it's uh, you know, it's, it, it was a lot of effort, a lot of time, uh, probably the most time to develop a design for, for a mural um, and, and kind of one of the biggest struggles to, to get implemented um, that I've ever been through. And, and it, it just kind of, for me, it, it spoke to how the city encouraged us and funded us on one hand and on the other hand refused to protect us once it was done. And it's like they're going to pour money into one thing and then allow it to just be destroyed in the next move. And, you know, so it, 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 there's definitely like a, a sadness to that, you know what I mean? Um, but we learned from, uh, you know, coming from the aerosol traditions, I mean, my first paintings were, were covered up the, by, the, by the morning. I painted, I would go to the other side of the city, paint on a rooftop, and go back to take a photo and it'd be gone. So there's always that temporariness of our work in permanence that, that you know, and that, that and my friend, uh, told me you know that our work is like prayers it's like you know so when the when it's wiped clean when they, they take the mandala and they wipe it back into, into sand that that's when the prayer is complete and so i've always you know said okay that that, per that mural has served its purpose and it's led to this other mural uh a lot of growth in that in that project and so i'm, I'm really happy to have you know learned a lot from the new piece and you know my first brush mural and <laughs> so just a lot of growth there. And so I think that hopefully um, there'll be opportunity for more growth, but the, but Oakland has just transformed so dramatically since from the, when that piece started in 2013 to 2020, like the entire city has completely changed uh, in a lot of ways for good. You know, there's a, like, you know, despite all the gentrification, there's a lot more art in downtown right now than you've ever seen before. And because of the protests around George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, 
uh, it's a lot of political art. It's a lot of, you know, what Oakland soul really has always been. Yes. And so I'm really, really thankful to actually see that that piece of Oakland still strong and vibrant and to have created something that really stands tall among all of that at that same time, you know, that like, it's just, it, you know, Oakland's spirit never dies. It's, it, that's a lot of this piece is about resilience and how people have consistently been displaced since the, they moved into the area, uh, starting with the Ohlone people um, who are all, always here. Um, and so that, but that somehow the culture is, is held together and strong and continues. And, and so, you know, the, the work that it takes in the organizing that Leyland does um, and the, the history that Halifu collects and has actively participated herself in the work that Spencer does in terms of documenting it, it's all a part of like that resilience. And so I, I, overall, I feel good about that, you know, and I'm thankful just to have been a, a small part of it. And, what, and, what's the address? Of, sorry, Haley, I just want if you could the address of the new mural, so if people did want to do a drive by and, and take a look at it. Oh, uh, three sixty Fourteenth Street uh, at Franklin in uh, downtown Oakland on the Green Lining Institute. The new piece is called Ascend Dance. Halifu and Leilan are both featured in it, nice. uh, and Spencer did a little filming around it too. So we're going to make a little a little story of that, but it's not going to be a documentary film, I don't think. <laughs> Let's say really crazy happens. <laughs> Heli, did you want to add something to that? Well, yes. I just wanted to remind Desi of uh, our big um, dedication opening of that Alice mural and how wonderful that was. It will always be etched in my memory um, because it really brought uh, the communities together. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm forgetting exactly what date. Uh, that was. Does anybody remember? It was June of 2016. Uh, and I remember that because that was the day I met Miss Beckford and she didn't uh, even know. Miss Beckford did not know she was on the mural until that day. Wow. And they wheeled her around the corner and she saw herself four stories tall. We interviewed her after the fact. We had been trying to track her down and get her information and interview her for months, for years, and we couldn't do it. Um, and so when she saw it, it was like a complete surprise. Like, oh, you're on the mural, blah, 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 blah. No, you're the centerpiece of the mural. This is <laughs> yes, she was. <laughs> yeah, and, so. and, 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 and uh, you know, I, li I live now in Sacramento. That's where I am right now. But I came to Oakland just for that dedication, and it was wonderful seeing my mentor, my first, one of my first dance teachers, uh, Ruth Beckford, who um, just passed a, a couple of years ago, uh, she, she was the centerpiece. And definitely it was, a, it was a, a great honor to be able to see her experience that. And uh, all the other artists who are a part of the uh, Malanga Cascade Lord Center, Zach and Naomi Diof, um, the uh, Carla, What's her name? Service. Uh, dancer. Service. Carla Dancer. And uh, all the people who now make up the Malanga Cascade Lord Center were all there drumming, dancing. Um, there was a, an, 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 uh, I think it was a, a Chinese uh, a American performing group that, that performed. It was so exciting. And so that will always be etched in my memory and many people's memory. So I just wanted to bring that up. The, the sadness of loss is also, you know, uh, it, it's, it's um, kind of mitigated by the fact that, that we now have the, the glory of that mural and the celebration of its dedication all in our memories now. And that will never die. It did look like a lot of fun, I have to say. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So we're, we're, we're starting around out of time. I just wonder, Spencer, maybe you could wrap up in, in what your hopes and plans are for getting this film out in the world and if there are particular audiences you're hoping to reach. You know, one of the ways we're actually using it at the festival, we'll also be showing this to schools. So if there's anything as far as, you know, what you want, what you're hoping that, that students or any of you want to say anything as far as what you hope some young people get from this story, um, um, particularly any young people who might actually live in Oakland, you know, we do a lot of, um, outreach in, in the East Bay, and, and we'll be sharing with as many um, Oakland schools as we can. So if there's anything you want to share with that, with that audience, we'd love for you to, to say so. 
Uh, well, I just want to say again, thank you so much to the Mill Valley Film Festival for you know hosting Alice Street as part of this year's festival. And we're really excited that the film will be seen by students throughout Oakland and perhaps uh, other areas in the Bay Area. Uh, for all those students out there, I think you know what was already said in the panel, there's so much within um, what each of the panelists uh, shared in terms of the history of coalition building among diverse uh, communities about the work being done um, to you know, fight against gentrification and to work towards community benefits, along with you know, um, Desi and, and Pancho and the approach they took to really make sure community was engaged in how um, and, and reflected in what went on that mural um, from the beginning. And I think that is an important lesson that I hope people get from the story is that all of that deep, intense work of bringing on a videographer, bringing on, um, you know, getting the, the stories in depth um, was the intention put into their process, created a piece that then people were willing to rally around. Um, if not for that intention, I don't know how that fight would have taken, would have played out. Um, I don't know how that event would have looked um, if not for all of the work and an investment in understanding uh, the stories that existed in that neighborhood and making sure that it was painted and, and portrayed uh, correctly. So uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, hopeful, uh, hopefully a lot of lessons and, um, and, you know, stories that can be inspiring for communities, especially at this time of uncertainty that we're all experiencing in this country. You know, I hope that this kind of, um, this story can be an inspiration and can, um, can also hold some, some important kind of takeaways. Um, to just mention, uh, we did get a grant uh, from the California Arts Council to tour the film around California. A lot, uh, doing impact uh, work in communities impacted by gentrification. Uh, we're figuring out how to do that at this time of COVID, um, but we're really excited about that and about how the film can be used as a tool uh, for communities that are doing work like this and can benefit from it. You know, that's, I think, what all of our hope is, is that, you know, use it, take it, you know, run with it. You know, um, how can that look in your community? Where is your Alice Street? Um, you know, and, 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 and so that's, I think, what our hope is for, for the film. Is there anything well else you add as far as um, from, a, from a student perspective or what you'd like, you know, young people to take away from your experience? Well, we are, we have, we have built out a curriculum uh, that, that, that go, that's going to be attached to this. We're in the final stages of completing that. And the other piece that, um, that, that's primarily for like high school students. And then the other piece that we're interested in um, is developing like an archive where we can ha like take those interviews and edit them down a little bit, maybe focus them by uh, subject matter and do more of like a locally based uh, deeper dive into, into specific stories around the community. And I've been having some conversations with uh, Roy Chan, who's featured in the film just a little bit from the Oakland Chinatown Oral History Project. And he, he's also very excited by that idea of just, you know, cultivating and collecting local stories and having a place that people who are really invested in like learning of the history of, uh, that we spoke about. We have a lot of stuff on the cutting room floor. And so I would love to, you know, turn that into something that, uh, you know, people can access and learn more about, you know, get the full interview from Halifu or Leilan uh, if you want to do a deeper dive. So. Does um, he, do you work with, do you work with young people as far as um, mural painting? Like, do you take on any? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have, I'm an artist in residency at Fremont High School uh, mm -hmm. right now. Our meeting is today. And um, we, uh, I'm also the art teacher at Oakland Unity Middle School. And normally I am the after school art teacher at Oakland Unity High due to this COVID restrictions and stuff like that. We've uh, had to um, cut that back this year, but I do a lot of work with different arts groups in the community and, um, you know, hopefully, uh, we're going to utilize these, these approaches to just, uh, tell more community stories. And there's just so many stories that still could be told just from 
the information we collected from Alice Street. <laughs> we have another 10 murals worth of, it, of, of <laughs> paintings to do. <laughs> And I, and I think that just as Spencer was saying, if, if this film is seen as a model for other communities to look at what is your Alice Street, um, it, it, it gives us a sense for the next generation to realize that we as humans are the masters of our own destiny. If we unify as, com as communities, we don't need charismatic leaders. We can do it ourselves. And yeah, building off of the curriculum, um, I think, you know, I work in the, in my day job, I work in the Oakland Unified School District. So we're actually having a movement right now towards ethnic studies and towards learning about Oakland history, because we actually don't learn a lot about our Oakland history in our Oakland schools, which is unfortunate. And I think this, yeah, comes right at the right time um, to be having these conversations, you know, as we're losing some of our history and culture, how do we actually make sure that future generations, you know, understand our deep and rich history and culture here in Oakland? and preserve it and make it themselves yeah so I'd say yeah for me I think you know knowing um, that you know we always have power um, with gentrification um, and displacement sometimes you, it's easy to feel really hopeless and that we can't do anything about it but what I saw you know traveling around the country was that communities are doing so much about it and that if the city officials are bold enough to implement policies to protect our cultural districts to protect our cities and what we love about them it's completely possible to save what we love and preserve it um, if we have the political will so I think, you know, at that at that planning commission meeting, um, one of our elder organizers, you know, said, you know, this is the best we're going to get from a developer. Like, you'd have to build an army to, to change this, you know, decades and decades of expecting very little from developers who are coming into our community. And I said, okay, well, we'll build an army then. <laughs> and, and we did. And we transformed the dialogue and we transformed the landscape of what people expected from development, that it had to be more equitable, that, you know, you can see in the film, you know, they, they took over the downtown uh, plan. <laughs> you know, artists did that. Um, they stepped in and said, you're not going to do this without us. So they completely changed the process um, and had a whole equity, downtown equity plan, um, you know, that's still in the works. <laughs> and we have to see kind of what comes out of it. But it empowered, you know, Oakland residents to really actually feel like they can be a part of these planning processes. You know, Oakland has um, not enough, you know, participatory planning processes and progressive policies like other cities like Philadelphia or the Twin Cities or Seattle actually have progressive planning policies where they actually engage communities. Um, and so for communities of color, especially low income communities to feel like they have power in participating in planning and development, like, you know, that, that, we can own our own city that we we pay taxes here we have contributed for decades and decades and hundreds of years to the development of this city that we should have a, a seat at the table and that you know the developers would you know often kind of balk at that and say you know who are you like you know why why do you have the right to demand these things from our project you know that's a private project and we're like these are our neighborhoods you know these aren't just parking lots these this is this is the lifeblood of our community um, this is, you know, our identity and our belonging. We are the people. Absolutely. Well, I just want to thank you all so much. This was such a great conversation. I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for the film, Spencer. I thank all of you for all your incredible work and your participation. Um, we look forward to sharing this, you know, further um, during the festival. And, and I just want to thank you all for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. And, and we'll, we'll you much. receive... Um, uh, information about the uh the opening of the fest the festival you will it's coming soon it's coming okay. yes thanks so much you guys and thanks to your beautiful cat busy <laughs> <laughs> she was good all the way to the end right <laughs> she wanted to be a part of it <laughs> she's part of the community <laughs> standing up <laughs> bye, bye.